from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon and welcome on behalf of the entire Folklife Center staff. I'm Judith Gray. I'm a Folklife Specialist and Coordinator of Reference Activities for the Folklife Center. I'd like to welcome you to this particular presentation of the Benjamin Botkin Folklife Lecture Series. The Botkin Series gives us an opportunity to invite some of the most exciting folklorists and eth ethnographers, both people in the academy and people from the public sector, to come and present some information on their latest research and findings. The lectures are an, an important acquisitions activity for the Folklife Center. As you'll see, this presentation is being videotaped and thus will become a permanent part of the collections of the Folklife Center. And some of the lectures also end up as webcasts on the library's website. So in this way, the Botkin Lecture Series helps the American Folklife Center fulfill its mandate to document, preserve, and present the folklife scholarship that informs and impacts our world today. I have the very special honor today of introducing Ed Schupman. He's a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma. I first got to know Ed in the 1980s when he and I, as fellow ethnomusicologists, worked right here at the library on the Federal Cylinder Project, a project that uh, cataloged, documented, and then ultimately returned copies of the early wax cylinder recordings to the native communities from which they came. After Ed left the library, he worked for Orbis Associates, an Indian-operated education consulting firm, and then with the Bureau of Indian Affairs Office of Indian Education Programs. And now, he's an education materials developer at the National Museum of the American Indian. He wrote their Native Words, Native Warriors website, which honors Native American code talkers. And he's the co-author of this book, Do All Indians Live in Teepees? Questions and Answers from the National Museum of the American Indian. And as you'll have seen on your way in, you would have an opportunity to buy this book if you're so interested. As is clear from the title, this is, the book is the basis for Ed's lecture today. And so please join me in welcoming Ed Schupman. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I seriously had a dream last night that I was in a rock band and we had been invited to uh, do a concert at my old high school. Uh, so um, thanks for coming to the show and <laughs> rock on. <laughs> um, I'd like to start today by uh, playing for you a recording of an American Indian love song. Who remembers it? <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding, right? With that one. Now I'll play you a real American Indian love song. This one is a uh, Muscogee Creek love song. It's called Four Corners. Four Corners is a reference to the uh, dance. Um, and uh, this will be sung by Joe Sulphur, who is a uh, well-known Muscogee singer. Oh, 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 oh,
Okay. So um, first one that we heard, of course, was Indian Love Call from the musical Rosemary. Um, music by Rudolf Frimmel, uh, lyrics by Otto Harbach and Oscar Hammerstein. Uh, you know, an example of the uh, romanticization of Native Americans and little to do with actual Native American music. Um, <clears throat> this one, of course, is. But just to show you how messed up things can get, let's listen to Joe talk about uh, what he observed with a, uh, another use of this Muscogee love song. and they were out in Seminole and they were supposed to be in a war zone and they were getting ready to attack and Gary Cooper and Bucks and the Seminole started singing. Yeah, they started singing that and we started laughing because, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... That's to kind of get us started in thinking about this topic today. I, I do want to express my deep gratitude for this uh, invitation to talk with you today. It's great to see a lot of friends and colleagues here, old and new. Thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'm here to talk about knowledge and awareness of American Indian peoples, cultures, histories, and contemporary lives among the general public and the educators of our country. Uh, as Judith mentioned, 22 years ago, I had the privilege of working for two years on the American Folklife Center's uh, Federal Cylinder Project. Um, <clears throat> that project brought me into contact with a, an incredible collection of real American Indian music and spoken word. Um, as the project disseminator in what was essentially an early example of uh, cultural repatriation, I was uh, privileged to work directly with about 25 uh, different American Indian communities in taking copies of those recordings back and had some uh, really amazing experiences doing that and I'll have some stories today to tell about some of that uh, work. Uh, after I left LC my uh, focus shifted and I really began what my career has been for the last 20 years which is uh, working in American Indian education. Um, the work of that time has been focused on uh, primarily training teachers to access good primary and secondary resources and to develop culture-based curriculum materials. Just over four years ago, I arrived back in Washington, D.C. in July, two months before the grand opening of the National Museum of the American Indian. And I want to tell you, it was an amazing time to arrive. Uh, the atmosphere was charged with anticipation, uh, excitement, and a lot of frenetic energy uh, in opening a new museum on the mall. Um, today I'm offering my own opinions. Uh, I don't claim to be a spokesman for all of Native America. This would not be culturally appropriate. And of course there are many different viewpoints, uh, Native and otherwise, on any given topic. I'm going to switch over to slideshow here. This uh, Indian love call and Joe Sulphur's story about the love song in the Gary Cooper movie, uh, I think demonstrate that there's been a lot of bizarre confusion about and misrepresentation of American Indians in American culture. There has been a lot of good scholarly work that's been done by others on, on this topic, and I'm not going to try to cover that comprehensively, but I'd like to take us briefly through a few examples that I've identified. First of all, there was no such thing as an American Indian until some time after Columbus's arrival. People identified themselves by their tribe or clan or community. Columbus identified the native peoples of Hispaniola as los indios. But the erroneous general terms, Amer Indian, American Indian, Native American later, have stuck and persist even to the present, grouping diverse cultures and peoples into some kind of an invented homogeneous mass. Individual and tribal identities and cultural diversity all suffer as a result of this homogeneous lumping. And this is something that we're still trying to address and correct today. Of course, Indians have also been greatly romanticized. Literature and art at different periods of time have played a role in the de development of these romantic notions. The uh, illustration on the left is one of 15 painted by N.C. Wyeth, beautiful illustrations actually, of uh, um, 
from a 1919 edition of The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper, a very romanticized Native American story. And then, of course, pulp fiction, such as the, uh, the Red Modocs here, many other examples. Uh, the film entertainment industry has also roman romanticized and perpetuated stereotypical ideas of Native peoples and cultures. This is a scene from uh, Annie Get Your Gun. Indian images have been seen and can still be seen on countless numbers of commercial products. I guess the connection here is uh, romanticized ideals, I don't know, wilderness, old time ways. Uh, the, I, the one on the right is a very curious uh, example of uh, selling of no nothing soap, K-N-O-W, nothing soap. You know, there's, um, there's an old joke in Indian country that says the typical Indian family is a mother, a father, two children, a dog, and an anthropologist. <laughs> Indians have been uh, objects of study ad, ad nauseum starting with people like uh, Frank Hamilton Cushing, but even before that, with travelers and naturalists, uh, this gentleman here, William Bartram, who traveled through the southeast, uh, through my people's territory of uh, Georgia and Oklahoma, or Georgia, Alabama, in that area. Uh, but uh, Jesuit and other missionaries, Lewis and Clark, you know, all of them did their studies of the natural people. Now, there's nothing wrong with academics and knowledge, but Indians have been really a, a, a study of, a focus of study for so long. Much of that work is perceived in Indian country as being exploitive, that it takes out of the community and gives very little back, and it's, it is being interpreted by and for outsiders. This remains a popular thing. You can still buy Indian costumes along with pirates, clowns, and superheroes. Now among these four categories, uh, pirates, clowns, superheroes, and American Indians, which one is a race of people? And which categories could include people of any race? The language that's been applied to native peoples over the years is also quite revealing of social attitudes at different points in history. I'll just bring out a few of them in no particular order. Good Indians, bad Indians, braves, bucks, squaws, warriors, noble warriors, savages, bloodthirsty, wild, primitive, disappearing, drunks, warlike, stoic, cigar store, show Indians, stubborn, lazy, hostile, princesses, chiefs, Indians, children, children of the forest, red men, and of course, red skins. Many of these images and terms are offensive. None of them are accurate. Some of them are racist and slanderous. Some are patronizing. Certainly none of them demonstrate awareness or any kind of respect for the complex and sophisticated cultures that have always existed among the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. I think it's important to remember that all of this imagery was developing historically against a backdrop of diseases, wars, genocide, dispossession of lands, and cultural repression being endured time and time again by hundreds of native nations across the continent. What I would like to see us educate toward is a list of terms that truly reflects the accomplishments, past and present, of native peoples, such as philosophers, intellectuals, doctors, engineers, farmers, agronomists, economists, statesmen, orators, diplomats, athletes, and more. Now, the National Museum uh, of the American Indian is part of the Smithsonian Institution. We welcome millions of visitors each year, people from all over the world, all ages. My first position at NMAI was as uh, coordinator of the Cultural Interpreters Program, where I was in frequent contact with our visitors. From opening day, I and the other staff members who worked on the floor began to hear an amazing array of questions that were on the minds of visitors. Now, of course, people come to the museum with unique backgrounds their educations, upbringings, and life experiences related to American Indians. They tend to arrive with many different kinds of expectations about what they will see or experience at the museum. Some are looking for objects that exemplify what they've seen, heard, or learned about Indians through popular imagery, and they're sometimes disappointed when they don't see those things represented. And we get questions, lots and lots of questions. But we welcome our visitors and we welcome their questions because 
they provide us with a long overdue opportunity to educate from the native perspective. I brought just a sampling of some of the questions that we hear in the museum. Of course, not everyone is looking for stereotypes. Many people are fairly well educated, and some very well educated. We get a lot of really good, insightful questions from visitors who are looking for more in-depth, comprehensive knowledge. We also get a lot of people exploring their ancestry. Some who uh, want help with their archaeological finds. And uh, some that demonstrate a clear lack of education experiences related to American Indians. And then some that are quite inflammatory. Some people just like to stir things up. And I would say that these are the most difficult for our staff to deal with. But our cultural interpreters and our visitor services staff are all very professional in handling even, even the most egregious of questions. But it takes its toll. It's a difficult thing to stand there and talk to someone who's asked you something like this. Although I have to say, with the first question, I mentioned this one to one of our development officers, and they said, hmm, not a bad idea. <laughs> I wonder if we could put that land in trust. I had the privilege of working with some very talented writers and editors in the uh, museum to answer most of, many of the common questions we received from visitors, both at our sister museum in New York, the George Gustav High Center of NMAI, and here at the museum on the National Mall. Uh, I think people lack good general information about the Indian world, and that's a niche that this book helps to fill. But there are some risks with a book like this. The answers are necessarily brief, and they provide an overview of information. But sometimes we're addressing very complex kinds of topics, such as philosophies and worldviews, ceremonies, and long histories. The risk is that you can oversimplify, and without very careful language, create even further confusion or, stere or new stereotypes. And this was one of the challenges in writing for this book. But I see it as a, a good primer, a good start, and I hope that it serves to stimulate people to, to seek deeper information, but to also counter some of these uh, stereotypes and, and mis mistaken ideas that we, we know of. So at this point, I have another musical interlude. Uh, this one is dedicated to my friends here at the Folklife Center. to get back to Uh, Joe, you know the name of that one? Indian War Hoop. Indian War Hoop. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. <laughs> That's called Indian War Hoop. That's Floyd Ming's Pep Steppers performing uh, Indian War Hoop. I don't know the era. I'm going to guess 30s, 40s, something like that maybe. Um, I like the tune. It kind of sounds like they've been into the fire water a little bit. Um, <laughs> Yelling is part of this string band tradition, apparently, and I found out, I read somewhere that the title of this song, which is Indian War Hoop, uh, led some people to think that this was actually an Indian band performing. It's not, it's a Mississippi string band. So again, another, another use of an, uh, an idea uh, that has nothing really to do with what an Indian, a real Indian war hoop would be and, and in what context it would be, it would be appropriate to use it. 
So, um, <clears throat> how did we uh, get into this situation? I, I think it's safe to say there's a great deal of confusion about American Indians. Let's take a look at the philosophers. Jimmy Buffett says he doesn't know, he doesn't care. Ignorance or apathy, one or the other. A little more seriously, there's nothing more frightening than ignorance in action. In his work titled uh, White Conceptions of Indians, the historian Robert Burkhofer identifies an element that's at the core of persistent misunderstanding of native peoples. A persistent theme in white imagery of Indians is the tendency to describe Indian life in terms of its deficiency in relation to white standards and ways, rather than a positive description in line with the framework of specific cultural un culture under consideration. In other words, the Indian world has rarely been viewed or accepted on its own terms. Euro-American ethnocentrism has had a variety of serious consequences for American Indians, not only in terms of living with distorted imagery, but also in dealing with catastrophic life changes that began in the 15th century and are still being felt today. At certain times in history, economic, political, and military motivations have also contributed to the dehumanization and stereotyping of Indian people. The historian Wilkham Washburn suggested, um, whoops, see where we are, that uh, British and Americans stereotyped the Indians as hunters and then used stereotyping as a rationale for taking their lands. The problem has been around a long time. Whenever one society wants to dominate, marginalize, or remove another, it's easier to rally, rally people to that cause by portraying the others as substandard or deficient in some way. Finally, uh, once an idea is uh, ingrained, it's terribly difficult to counter. Think about the nature of false rumors. We all know how false rumors can get started. It only takes a second, but it can be a very difficult task to erase one, can it? So it is with myriad false images of Native America. I've been talking about the effects of, these, of this imagery in the general population, but imagine its impact among Indian children who grow up seeing and hearing these same distortions. I've heard many uh, speakers, Indian speakers, talk about their confusion, their shame, the effects on their self-esteem as children when confronted with these stereotypical and offensive ideas that they saw on TV or heard in their school classrooms. Now, people can't be faulted for ignorance they're born with, but we know better now, perpetual ignorance is the fault of society. Not just those in the, uh, our teachers, but not just those in the classroom, our families, our communities, in short, anyone that has an influence on us as we grow up. Once people are educated and informed appropriately and accurately, then ignorance should fade. It's been over 500 years now since Cristobal Colon called us Los Indios. Two questions that I find compelling for the field of education. Why have we not as a society or a country addressed this problem adequately? After all this time, why are we still talking about whether all Indians live in teepees? What can we do about it? Education is where the problem can and should be addressed. Working with young people to build new perspectives, new ways of understanding, and relating to people and the world around them, and in this case to provide more thorough and accurate information about Indians. Given the confusion and prevailing social attitudes of past centuries, our education system has operated from a deficit. Lacking good information, good materials, training, and the ability to collaborate with and cooperate with Indian peoples themselves. Education and, about, education about and even for Indians has often revolved around activities such as making paper headdresses, Indian masks, putting on a play about Hiawatha, or the mythical Thanksgiving story. We still have classes of young children who come to the museum with their paper headdresses on. In those instances, our staff uses the opportunity to educate by gently explaining why it's inappropriate. Now, we have some teachers and parents who understand and accept that explanation, and others who frankly resist it, resent it, actually. Textbooks in the past contained errors, such as contextually inaccurate illustrations, a teepee in Navajo land, or a Wampanoag from New England wearing a plains headdress, a really popular song in music textbooks for a number of years was known as the Navajo Happy Song. 
the ethnomusicologist and my friend David McAllister did some research and found that this was actually an opening song for a Native American church or peyote ceremony. It's a totally inappropriate use of a ceremonial song uh, in a general music textbook, but s because it had a catchy melody, it was used extensively by music educators, who through no fault of their own knew it only as the Navajo Happy Song. I'm happy to say that the Navajo Happy Song no longer exists in at least one major publisher's repertoire. Unfortunately, children who have not been edu accurately educated about Native peoples grow up to be uninformed lawmakers, civic officials, ranchers, land management officials, and others. We're not talking about needing to know who lived in what style of house in the 15th century here. We're talking about treaties, what tribal sovereignty means, and what its implications are. We're talking about the cultural reasons behind Indian nations' efforts to preserve our lands, sacred places, water, and to protect our plant and animal relatives. That's the kind of information that's critical everywhere, but especially in those areas where Indian people are still a significant part of the population. I think that schools rarely go that far with Indian content, however. So what has happened is that the responsibility of education about, educating about these important issues has often fallen upon Indian communities themselves, creating a need for a community to mobilize or a tribal government to mobilize around issues and depleting resources that could be used for many other purposes in places where unemployment reaches 60 or 70 percent or higher. I want to be clear, though, it's critical that Indian tribes and peoples tell their own stories, their own histories, and they do that from their own cultural paradigms. The Indian voice has for too long been denied. Now, one of the people that I came into contact with on the dissemination of the Federal Cylinder Project was a gentleman by the name of William Tallbull. William Tallbull was a Northern Cheyenne. He was head of the Northern Cheyenne Culture Committee, and he was the appointed liaison for the library to work with in the dissemination of that collection. So I went to, uh, went to Lame Deer, Montana, and I met with the culture committee there. There were two of them that came that day. There was uh, Bill Tallbull and, and Charles White Dirt. Charles White Dirt spoke no English. So everything that I said was translated into Cheyenne by Bill and, and given to Charles. And then Charles would say something in Cheyenne, and it would be translated back to me in English. And after we had this meeting, Bill offered to spend some time with me and said, you want to see some of the sites? And I said, sure. So he took me out. And as we were walking around on some of the prairie land out there, he said, uh, started to tell me about an experience that he had. He had taken a friend of his on a fishing trip into the mountains not far from their reservation. And they had gone near a place that was a sacred spot for the Cheyenne and other tribes of that, that area. Uh, this friend of his was fishing, and Bill decided to kind of lay down and take a little rest. And it was at that moment that the creator decided to come to him with a vision. Now, Bill told me about this vision, and he, the point of my talking about this today is not the vision itself, but it is what he said next to me, which was, he said, I need to find somebody to write this down for me. He says, because if I say it, nobody will believe me. If, uh, if I could get Peter Powell, that's uh, uh, Father Peter Powell, the noted Cheyenne historian, or historian about Cheyenne culture, uh, he said people would believe that, but if I write it, no one will believe it. I think this is a good example of how the Indian voice has been repressed, and that feeling is, is there in Indian country. So um, I do want to say I'm happy to say that Bill did find his voice, uh, at least with one publication, this one. Um, that was published by the Fort Phil Kearney Bozeman Trail Association in 1988, the Northern Cheyenne history of the Battle of 100 in the Hands, or the Fetterman Battle. And it's a wonderful account told from the Cheyenne perspective of this episode of, of uh, the wars that took place in the 1860s on the plains. And I've used this uh, quite a bit in, in education materials and juxtapose it against accounts by white historians and allow students to do an analysis. Look at the difference of language. Look at the difference of perspectives. So um, we need to facilitate more of that. And I believe the most effective work can be done when educators engage in real and long-term partnerships with Indian communities in developing curricula and preparing teachers. 
And with the internet, it's becoming more and more possible, even in places that are not in proximity with Indian communities, to find good resource materials, many of them developed by Indian tribes or individuals. In more recent times, curricula and standards of uh, learning have become more accurate, albeit cursory, with regard to Indians. In social studies classes, fourth graders usually study the Indian people of their state, usually just the Indians of the past. Thanksgiving is a popular time to teach about Indians, as is the whole month of November, which is designated as Native American Heritage Month. Students at higher grade levels get smatterings of Native content, but usually only at points where that content intersects with major issues or eras in United States history. Contemporary Indian life is virtually ignored. Now, in some geographic locations and in classrooms of particularly motivated teachers, students receive a broader range of information. My work in Indian, Indian education has taught me that uh, most teachers are highly motivated, very admirable people who want to do the right things. They're looking and asking for good, reliable materials. They come to us at the museum looking for materials, things they can count on. However, with standardized testing and the demands of no child left behind, teachers face enormous challenges in the classroom. Uh, there's little time for deviations from standard-based curricula and the emphasis on testing. What many of us have been trying to demonstrate is that you can teach a child to read. You can teach them to synthesize information and think critically with American Indian content. You can teach about systems of government, how to read a map, astronomy and other sciences, and many other topics based on information that's ground in, grounded in millennia-old indigenous knowledge systems and experiences. Sometimes it gets a little difficult, though, when as a trainer you have to break down long-cherished myths. Uh, another experience that I had in 1992, which was the quincentenary of the Columbus uh, uh, episode, the, uh, I was asked to train a, a school of uh, teachers, uh, elementary school teachers, and I had talked with the principal ahead of time, and I said, well, what, do you, what kind of approach do you want with this? Uh, you know, sometimes this is pretty hard hitting, you know, uh, we start breaking down myths, and she, she says, let them have it, you know, we want, it, we want to know. So we spent the day together, and I tried to provide some materials and guidance as to what's appropriate, what's authentic. And, you know, started breaking down myths like Thanksgiving and uh, why it's not appropriate to make masks or headdresses. And, you know, uh, I remember towards the end of the day, there was one particularly frustrated teacher who just said, Ed, what do Indians want? Okay? <laughs> so well, that's what I've been talking about. Um, you know, we want to be represented accurately. We like to tell our own stories. We'd like you to, uh, to teach about who we really are. And uh, so, you know, there's a lot, to, a lot to overcome. I'd like to uh, tell you about one example of some, uh, a promising trend. Uh, this is in the state of Montana, uh, which, you know, I, I don't, how many of you have ever spent any time in Montana? Anybody? A few people. You know, it's, it's a pretty rural place and not a very diverse population, but there's a lot, of, not a lot of Indian people still in Montana. Well, some activists got together and really pushed, and in, the con in 1972 were able to force a constitutional amendment. And uh, recognizing the unique and distinct cultural heritage and preservation of American Indians. Uh, then finally, in 1999, notice that it's, uh, what, 27 years later, uh, Finally, there was some legislation passed that would require education to address that uh, uh, piece of the Constitution of the state. And then there were seven essential understandings that every student in Montana should get about American Indians. And what's admirable, admirable about this effort is that Native people from the communities in Montana were engaged to write these essential understandings. So uh, I'm going to put those up there, and I apologize for the small print. But, um, you know, you can sort of see that there's, there's great diversity among the 12 tribal nations of Montana. There's great diversity among individual American Indians. The ideologies of native traditional beliefs and spirituality persist into modern day life as tribal cultures. 
Reservations are lands that have been reserved by the tribes for their own use through treaties, not given to them. There were many federal policies put into place throughout American history that have impacted Indian people. Okay, so these are really important, really key pieces of information that really every person should understand. This is your history too, you know? Everything that, uh, every place that we live in this country was once Indian land. This country was built on Indian land, stolen Indian land. And the events that occurred, and you come down to our museum, you'll see exhibits about history that talk about the, um, you know, the transfer of technologies and, and uh, the impact of the gold, for instance, that was taken out of the Americas and uh, the diseases and the uh, uh, idea, uh, ideas that were exchanged. So this is a, a, a thing that continues to affect all of us today. I saw recently that the state of Mexico has rec recently officially adopted a Navajo language textbook, the first of its kind. State of New Mexico. Thank you, Jenny, for that piece of information. Okay, you ready for another musical interlude? All right. Here we go. There's more. <laughs> you can see the bigness, feel the freshness, and in Ham's beer you can taste it. A taste as big and fresh as the land of sky blue water. Ham. Ham. Okay, how many of you remember those? Old enough to remember those, I do. Huh? Not that particular song, but there was another one called uh, Riding Bear. Okay. Oh, yeah. That beat and everything. Right. So that beat, that boom, 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 that's been a real popular stereotype misconception about Native American music. One of the things, one of the questions that I was asked to write an answer to uh, in this book is, question, do Indians do rain dances? So uh, in uh, uh, thinking about this selection, I'd like to read just a little bit uh, from this question for you. Yes, some tribes maintain the tradition of rain dances. Like all humans, Native peoples of the Americas have always understood the connection between rain and life. Traditional Native American views include a recognition that rain at the right times and in the appropriate amounts is a vital component of a well-functioning natural world. This knowledge is deep, based on the collective experiences of thousands of years. All people depend on rain to fill the rivers, to help plants grow, and to nurture life. Among, among groups that practice traditional agriculture, the connection to rain is even more critical. Native cultures conceptualize and participate in these relationships with the natural world in a wide range of ways. Ceremonies, prayers, ritual art, uh, songs, and yes, dances are among the many ways that Native people acknowledge and help to maintain the delicate balance in nature. These spiritual and culturally important activities are not practiced randomly. They are part of complex religious cycles that occur throughout the year, year after year. It's hard to know when or why these important activities were first caricatured, joked about, and denigrated in American society and media. Uh, inaccurate and stereotypical images often misrepresent native cultures. The reality of cultural practices, such as rain dances, is, of course, much more meaningful and humanly rich than the popular images portray. We have to move on from those places where we've been stuck for 500 years. It's not my aim to create any hostility focused on differences among people. I think that today there are many in our society who believe that we would be better off if all of us were more or less the same. 
I understand that sentiment given the long history of worldwide, worldwide strife based on ethnicity and race. But if we weren't fighting over ethnic, racial, or religious differences, I, I think it wouldn't be long before we would find something else to fight about, like the color of our shirts or what side of town we live on. Wait a minute. We're already, we're already fighting over that, too. I take a little different view. I think we need to change to evolve as human beings. I would like us to teach our children not to merely tolerate, but to embrace differences among people. And then for us as a diverse society to use the richness of cultures and culture-based knowledge to help us grow as peoples. Now some adults might call that idealistic, but I think children can understand it. It's an exciting time. People in various disciplines are looking to American Indians and other indigenous people who hold knowledge that can help address contemporary worldwide problems. These are people and organizations that are looking at sustainable living models, such as the local foods movement, organic farming, biomimicry and engineering, health scientists looking at issues such as diabetes and obesity prevention. Native people as well are acquiring advanced and terminal degrees as scientists, economists, engineers, social theorists, and they're collaborating with others in their fields to look at traditional knowledge systems and how they can contribute to the modern world. The respected elder and Onondaga chief, Orrin Lyons, spoke about deeply embedded indigenous knowledge and sounded a warning at a recent climate change symposium held at NMAI. Can you all see that well enough to, to read it? No? We're an old voice, indigenous peoples, very old, very ancient. You learn by living in one place for a long time. That knowledge now becomes important. We are, after all, one people. It's not white or red or black or yellow. We can exchange blood, you and I. That makes us family, brothers and sisters. Instead of competition, it's got to be cooperation. We can't have this racist fight anymore. We can't because we as human beings have to get together for survival now. The earth will bring balance because that's what it does. It will do it through disease, it will do it through crisis, lack of food, lack of resources. Exploitation of energy. Business as usual is over, and you better understand that, and you better work with that idea if your children will have any kind of good life. Powerful message. In reflecting on my work now in over 150 American Indian communities throughout my career, a couple of key things I would like to share. I've become aware how thorough the attempts at dispossession and dehumanization of Native peoples, their lands, and cultures were, and how many, consequen how many of those consequences our Indian people still live with. But I've also become aware of how tenacious Indian peoples are. The Native spirit is still alive. The strong sense of family and community, humor, creative spirit, the connection to traditional worldviews, and their survival of culture uh, a dynamic culture that is living and changing. It's uh, all survived in spite of everything that's happened. I have one more anecdote from my travels uh, for the f uh, Federal Cylinder Project. I visited one community in the southeast where, uh, <clears throat> as part of the dissemination visit, I was asked if I would uh, meet with the powwow club, the group of young people who are involved in, in powwow dancing and uh, if I would tell them about the cylinder collection of their tribe's music. So I said, of course I would, and, and we, we sat, and I sat with those young people and played some of the songs for them. Now, this is a community where they still have language, but the ceremonies, the dances, uh, all of that's gone. And I'll never forget this. It's always stuck with me. The leader of the powwow club turned to me and said, can you teach us our dances? I said, no, I can't. Um, you know, uh, I tried to guide them maybe to some communities where they might get some, some clues that would help them. But to me, this is an illustration of these two points that I just made, that there has been so much decimation of culture, but yet that spirit is still alive, and that, that uh, idea of we want to know, we want to learn, and if we can't do our own stuff, we'll do powwow, we'll, do, we'll learn that way, and, and, and that's good enough. Sometimes I wish we could wipe this slate clean. I wish we could erase much of the history, all these negative images, ideas, and words from the public's collective memory. Now, I know that's idealistic, 
But part of what we're trying to accomplish with our exhibits, our education programs and materials at NMAI is to help the world understand native peoples and cultures from fresh new perspectives. Not as relics of some bygone time placed in a museum display case, but as living cultures. Our museum is, uh, mission is to provide real, accurate, and educationally viable information in partnership with these vibrant Indian communities. I invite you to come to our museum or visit one of hundreds of tribal museums and culture centers across the United States. Let us tell you who we are on our own terms and in our own ways. We have a lot of bad information to erase and we'll start at whatever level we need to. I have one final musical postlude to share with you. When I worked at LC, we had a tradition of making up song lyrics to sing to well-known tunes. Well, I think we did it at least once. So in honor of that tradition, I have an original composition that I'll sing for you. I call it People Not Mascots, and it's sung to the tune of the tomahawk chop. <laughs> oh, 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 the Atlanta Braves are a good baseball team, <laughs> but the song they're fancying perpetuates negative stereotypes <laughs> of American Indians as warlike peoples. Oh, 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 thank you very much. <laughs> I'm Nancy Gross. On behalf of the American Folklife Center, I wanted to thank you for com coming and remind you that our next Bakken lecture will be on September 4th. Marjorie Bong Lu from California will be talking about Quan Chi, which is a precursor to Chinese opera. And also we'll be having uh, our homegrown concert on August 20th. Um, uh, Gary ha Hamaleo, I, I'm probably murdering his name, but pretty close, okay? <laughs> and he, he and his band, uh, Hawaii G Flat Key Guitar, playing from Nevada. So you're welcome to come to that. That's August 20th, and then our next Bakken will be September 4th. Thank you so much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.